Air Force Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Air Force Podcast. I'm your host, Tech Sergeant Billy O'Brien. Today, we're going to be listening to part one of a two-part conversation with the first guardian in space, Colonel Nick Haig. Haig will represent approximately 14,000 military and civilian guardians who continue to support NASA and commercial missions in, from, and to space. Tech Sergeant Lance Valencia and Tech Sergeant Nick Katz caught up with him to talk about his previous experiences and what he's looking forward to most as he prepares for the journey. Once aboard the space station, Haig will transition to the role of flight engineer where he and his crew will conduct a wide-ranging set of operations and research activities. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, this is Sergeant Ketz. Uh, he also is a Nick as well. I've met Colonel Haig. I have a picture with Colonel Haig. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was at Space House. Uh, they, General Raymond introduced us. Oh, nice. Yeah, and then also, I mean, Mrs. Colonel Haig was also our boss for a little while. I do, I do remember her, yes. But uh, down to the business end of this, sir. Um, so you're going up soon. This is your second trip into space. Um, what are you most excited for? Uh, about this upcoming trip? You, you know, I, I get that question a lot. You know, what are you looking forward to the most? And that is a super hard question to try to answer. Um, if, if you just think about strapping yourself to a rocket, there's a lot of exhilaration and excitement and, and nervousness and anxiety that goes along with just riding a rocket into space. And then, you know, once that 12 minute ride's over, then we're going to spend, you know, over... Uh, roughly 200 days up there uh, on orbit and and you know that's going to be just living in space is just so different than living and working down here on the earth and and so it's those little moments that you never predict that are the ones that I cherish the most when I think about what I was in you know, my time up there previously and and getting to stare at the earth is you know is a, is a pretty pretty amazing vantage point yeah, I could imagine. Uh, and could you give us an example of one of those like little little moments uh, you were just describing? It, it, it's you've you've probably seen videos of astronauts playing with water. Mm -hmm. Just watching a a a small little sphere of water dance in front of you, and as the surface of that just kind of undulates, and then and then you start to play with it. You you poke your finger into it and. And rather than bouncing off like you, you kind of want it to do because your mind just thinks it's a ball and it should bounce away, but it kind of just sticks to your finger like glue. And then when you try to pull your hand out of it, just like you, if you take your hand out of a tub of water, you don't expect the water in the tub to stick to your hand and follow it. And, and that ball of water just sticks to your finger and then starts to crawl up your finger because of surface tension. And so just these strange little ways that challenge your basic understanding of everything around you and how it behaves are just, are just like little magical moments. Wow. And does your brain ever adjust to that? Like, does it ever accept that or does it always kind of feel surreal to you? There are always pinch, you know, the pinch me moments, you know, I can't believe this is really happening, but you do adapt. And that was one of the the amazing things is, you know, I was launching last time in my 40s. You kind of have this picture of yourself having, you know, spent four decades on this planet, having grown into your body that you're kind of who you are and your body is what it is. And to go up there and to feel your body adapt to this new environment, physically adapt, you know, your, your spine grows, your, your muscles start to get a little weak if you don't work out, the, the fluid in your body isn't pulled down to your feet, and so the pressure distribution in your body changes, and you feel all of these changes, but you also feel the shift mentally. At some point, my mind stops listening to my inner ear because it's confused, it can't decide which way is up and down, but my eyes can. So my mind just stops listening to my, my inner ear or the way you navigate through the space station stops being based on up and down and left and right. It's this three dimensional map and, and your mind just has makes this shift. So about four months into the, the, my, my seven month mission last time, I felt this very distinct realization that all of a sudden my mind was predicting things to behave 
as if they were in microgravity floating around rather than predicting things to behave like they were on earth under the influence of gravity and then being surprised when they did something different. And, and it was a, a stark realization on the ground after I landed that, you know, when I would drop something, it fell and my mind would think that that object was 600 pounds because it fell so quickly and so fast with such a thud because my mind was expecting it to float. And it took a while for me to, to readapt back to Earth. So we're super adaptable. And uh, that's just one of those fun experiences that you get is going through that transformation up there and then going through it back down here on the Earth again. Oh, wow. That's, that's crazy. It must be quite the interesting moment when you are kind of out of microgravity and back in the gravitational pull of Earth. What's that like You know, when you land and you get out of your seat for the first time uh, and you try to stand up back uh, in gravity. What does that feel like? Your body has never felt heavier. <laughs> you feel like you're four or five times heavier than you should be, and it just takes effort to lift your arm. And, and then when you stand up, you're a little wobbly uh, as long as your eyes are open. But as soon as you close your eyes, now my, you know, really close after landing, I'm still not listening to my inner ear. So when I close my eyes, my body has no way to know how to, how to stay upright. And so I just immediately fall over. And, and so you've got people that are holding on to you and, and, but the, you know, the body's amazing in how quickly it adapts. So I would take a nap after I'd wake up for a nap there would be some kind of step function improvement, you know, this big leap and improvement in my, my mind readapting to the earth. And so then over the course of a day, a day and a half, I was able to walk unassisted, you know, albeit a little wobbly, I was able to walk on my own and get to where I was at and people weren't worried about me, you know, falling over if I closed my eyes. Does that give you any like concerns for uh, your future health at all? Yeah, it is one of those things that we're studying. Um, on, on the space station, we do a lot of experiments to try to really tease out, you know, what happens when you take gravity out of, out of things. And you know, we, part of the things that we're trying to discover is what it does to the, to the human body. And so I'm, last time around, I was subject to a couple dozen experiments where I was the guinea pig in the experiment. Uh, and this time around will be very similar. And so we're studying all of those effects. And it's how we adapt on orbit, how we readapt to, to life on under gravity, how we counteract those things so that they don't have long-term negative effects. Um, but, you know, without doubt, there's, uh, these are questions we don't know the answers to. And we probably won't know until we have several, mm -hmm. we don't fly people to space all that often. And to really make good scientific conclusions, you need a real big sample size. I need lots of test subjects. And so we're not going to know for a while, um, but we've got to start posing those questions and getting some initial data to figure it out. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. And how does that feel, too, knowing that, like, uh, you know, the, the uh, experiments you, you were a guinea pig for, like you were saying, uh, on that physical condition of the body and those future health concerns, like, and, and just knowing that, that, like, one day, like, that information will be used, like, to help people you know, do extended periods of times in space travel, maybe one day. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's, you know, the job is a privilege. Um, and it feels pretty good to be able to contribute in whatever small little way that may be, you know, it, it might be just, I'm a data point in an experiment, but Hey, maybe that helps us draw some conclusions. And it doesn't just have to be for people that are flying in space or going to another planet. You know, one of the big things we look at is bone loss. And so you're not, under, you're not under load on the space station continually like you are on the ground. And so your bones will naturally, uh, you know, naturally deteriorate. And so you lose bone mass while you're on orbit. And, and so a lot of the things that we're doing in terms of countermeasures are the same types of things that we can use for people that are recovering from injuries in hospitals that are bedridden because they don't stand under load all the time. Or it could be applied to our older population where as you get older, your bones naturally thin. And, and so there's a broad applicability for the things that we're researching up there. Yeah, that, that's 
that's amazing. And it makes me think of, um, you know, my granddad, uh, his sister was married to a man and, uh, he had polio. He's like one of like, I think probably the last people with polio and being bedridden like that. And I remember meeting him as a little kid and, you know, they were talking about, you know, the withering away of his, you know, his body and also his bones specifically. And it's crazy that that's being worked in ways to mitigate up there in space with that information they're collecting. And Nick, I think you had something as well, right? Yeah, it's just, I think what's really interesting, sir, and I was hoping maybe you can speak to it, is I think I think when people think of astronauts and they think of, uh, you know, people in your shoes, I don't think they think a lot about the fact that, yeah, you're an astronaut, but really you're, you're a scientist. You have to do so many different experiments while you're up there, um, you know, outside of just the human body, but you guys do a whole bunch of other experiments with like, I think like plants and like studying space and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah, it, I mean that's the reason we're up there is is to conduct all of those scientific experiments. Um, you know, when it's not focused on the human body, we're looking at how do we how do we grow plants in space? You know, trips to Mars, trips to the Moon. If we have if we have permanent presence on the Moon, those long trips to Mars, we're gonna have to figure out a way to sustain ourselves, and we can't send resupply missions every month or two like we do right now with the space station. So how do we grow food? It seems like a trivial thing to put a seed in some soil and pour water on it and give it some light and have it grow. But when there's no gravity, where does the plant know to grow to? How does it grow a root structure? How do you get the water to the roots if I don't have gravity to pull water down through the soil? And so those are fundamental mechanisms that we're trying to understand so that we can eventually grow high enough yield to sustain people long term in space. Um, we do some really crazy experiments and, and calling me a scientist, I, I'm flattered, but I, I, I have colleagues that are astronauts that are scientists. I would consider myself more of a lab technician in that I have the privilege of, of being the, the hands and the eyes and, and the ears of the scientist in the space station, but the brain trust is on the ground and, and you know, I never imagined that I was going to hook up a 3D printer that was designed to print human tissues and eventually human organs so that they could be sent back down to be used in transplants. Um, I never imagined that I'd be, you know, pipetting and, and sequencing DNA and using CRISPR technology to do gene editing on orbit. That was never in, you know, I'm a... I'm an aeronautical, astronautical engineer. Uh, those were things I never imagined I'd be doing. And, and so it's fun to get involved with, with that. And it's even more fun to be tied on the radio with those scientists and, and to hear the excitement in their voice when you're doing one of these experiments that may only last a couple minutes, but they've been working a decade trying to get to the point where they could pose that question and collect that data. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. I think one of the things that uh, I'm really interested in, I think a lot of people are too, sir, is, um, you know, with this being your second trip up, if I believe right, you're not going up on a Soyuz this time. You're going to go up on a Dragon capsule. Is that correct? I am. So we'll launch on a Crew Dragon. Our, our uh, mission is, crew, is NASA's Crew 9 mission, uh, scheduled to launch in the, uh, the latter part of August and go up for a, a roughly six month stay aboard the space station. Uh, same mission as last time, just a different means of getting to and from the space station. What's So what's that been like? Because from what I've seen, I'm a big space nerd and I, I like watching all the videos and, and seeing the difference between the Crew Dragon compared to the Soyuz spacecraft itself. It looks like you got a little bit more leg room uh, on this trip. There is, there is uh, quite a bit more room on the interior. I, it is, it is, it's, it's a night and day it's fun. I'm an engineer, I, you know, so it's fun to see the same problem. I got to get people from the surface of the earth to the space station and to see the two dramatically different approaches that were taken to get there. And, and SpaceX being, you know, they've been flying, Roscosmos, uh, Russia has been flying Soyuz for decades. And so there's a long history of, of, of spiral improvement and slowly making that vehicle what it is today. Um, and then you've got SpaceX that is relatively new by comparison, and they've been able to start with a clean sheet and incorporate, you know, some of the latest technology from the get-go, and and it's uh, 
It's a joy to ride in both. Uh, I'm looking forward to the real ride rather than simulated rides in Dragon and, uh, and looking forward to seeing what the, the Falcon 9 rocket feels like as it's uh, hurtling off the pad. Yeah, and, and before that launch and during, is there any moments that you have that like, make you nervous specifically? Yeah, you know, the we spend, I'd say we spend roughly 95% of our training focused on what to do when something goes wrong. And so the mentality that you develop is, and, and this on my previous launches, the mentality is I'm always thinking in the moment right now, what is the next thing that could go wrong? What's the next worst thing that could go wrong and how would we respond to it? And so you're constantly thinking about all these negative things as you're experiencing, you know, I'd argue one of the most spectacular experiences you could have. Um, but you're, you're, you're in that bubble and you're focused on, on doing the job. And, and it's, you know, it's all due to that training program that we're a product of and, and the hard work of the, you know, teams of thousands that, that are that training program that get us ready for that day. So in terms of nervous, the, the biggest nerves are, I just don't want to make a mistake. You know, everybody, there's a lot of people that have invested their time, their blood, sweat, and tears, their lives into training crews to be successful. And so I think predominantly crews just don't want to make mistakes, uh, but we're human. And, and so then figuring out how to work together as a crew so that when somebody makes a mistake, we can cover to get, recover together as a team and then still be successful is, is what it's all about. This concludes part one. Thank you so much for listening. Please join us next time for the conclusion of our conversation with Colonel Nick Haig. The Air Force Podcast.